Thank you very much. There are all sorts of important questions that we answer in this forum, but this one is by far the most important, which is where should you put your money? Um, and to do that, we have the Swaidmi, uh, Dina Paul McCormick, Global Head of Sustainability and Inclusive Growth, Global Head of Sovereign Business at Goldman. We have His Excellency, Mansour Ibrahim Al Mumud, the CEO of Qatar Investment Authority, one of the biggest investors in the world. We have Bill Winters, the CEO at um, Standard Chartered. Your Excellency, let me begin with you. Put simply, which part of the world do you think looks most attractive from an investment point of view? I, I did see your, you've added the amount of emerging markets from 10 to 20% of your portfolio, but which, which bits interest you most? Is that, is that going towards China or maybe India? I will try to, to put it simply, as you said. But um, as you know, market is changing right now. And as we say in English, uh, the sea is changing. <laughs> uh, you have a higher uh, interest rate with the rhythm of acceleration that have not seen before. You are talking about inflation, which has which apparently become a sticky inflation, high labor market. Uh, so, so a lot of changes has been happening in the market. This is, of course, will reflect into some popular asset classes that has been uh, there because there is a tide in liquidity from the bank. So, I would assume for the last two years we have been very active in the credit space. Okay. Uh, companies that has been feeling the tide and they have a very good business models, but they have an issue. Does that, very quickly, does that mean both private credit as yes. well as public? Yes. So they have an issue with their balance sheet uh, because of this acceleration of hikes of interest rate. So normally uh, an institution like us who are very liquid, very long term, have uh, a risk appetite on these uh, type of investment would be an interesting to invest in this space. So I would advise that uh, <laughs> for the next maybe one year, the credit space would be an interesting space to deploy some investment. And what mm -hmm. about regionally? Is there a particular region that, that interests you at the moment? The region allocation that we have is really governed by by a long-term vision that we have, whether this is for the US market or Europe or emerging. When I say emerging, I'm talking about China, India, Brazil, for example. And on each one of them, you need to have your own sort of a process and assessment to identify opportunities. So for example, the rhythm that we are investing in technologies is in China and India would be a little bit more than the rhythm that we are investing in technologies in Brazil. So each market will have its own characteristic to, to really identify some of the, of the opportunities that, uh, that you would deploy. But uh, all in all, you have some sort of an allocation, which around, for us, for example, around 20% of our allocation in that particular market. Mm -hmm. Just one last quick one on that. Has India now got past the Adani Group troubles. We just had a story today pointing out that the Adani Group has come, up, come back up to the same level. Do you think that has gone through? The, see, we have a good relationship with Adani Group. We have invested on in, uh, the electrical distribution of Mumbai. And that particular business is uh, as a private business and it doesn't have any issues in terms of the, uh, you know, the liability issue that Adani Enterprise went through. Uh, you know, Adani has, uh, uh, he's a very well-known businessman. He managed to, to go through the difficulties that, you know, uh, the Adani enterprise went through. They managed to reduce their leverage. And uh, I'm sure that they will, uh, they will go through it uh, smoothly. Dina, can I turn to you? You're head of sovereign wealth business at, at Goldman. Where are you, is that a typical thing? Where are you seeing the big sovereign wealth funds Put their money. Sure. Well, first, I want to thank His Highness. I want to thank uh, His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed and Your Excellency and Mike Bloomberg and the Bloomberg team for hosting us in Doha. You know, being here, I think you feel the vibrancy of the economy. You feel the energy. You feel the entrepreneurship. And, you know, frankly, that's because of the leadership. The leadership here that's been investing for a long time, as His Excellency stated, 
in very important sectors and really thinking about their next generation. Obviously, sovereign wealth funds for many decades have been unique investing platforms. They're very reliable, they're consistent, uh, and they're long-term thinkers, and that is very, very important. But they also have tended to be um, innovative capital providers. So when you think about artificial intelligence, life sciences, you think about um, green and renewable. I mean, isn't it interesting that it really has been the Gulf countries with His Excellency's leadership at QIA and other sovereign wealth funds that have really led the investments around renewable, green, and climate transition. It's very forward thinking, and it's made a, a huge impact. Um, you were talking about regions. I was uh, telling His Excellency, actually, if you look at the U.S.-China relationship today, and we've heard this, of course, all day, it's very complicated, and I believe likely to get more complicated, at least in the near term. I think you'd agree with that, John. And of course, Europe, we have the war going on, and Jan Hatzius, our economist at Goldman, believes that, unfortunately, there's more of a likelihood of a recession there. So the Middle East is quite an interesting investable region right now, with the price of oil where it is, and where these unique opportunities lie. Are you, are you, are you assuming a U.S. recession? Jan Hatzius is more optimistic, actually, so he believes there, if there is one, it will be shorter and milder than others. But to the, question, to the uh, previous panel, you know, I think what happens on that is very important. On the debt ceiling, yes. where you were, I should say, you were obviously part of the National Security Advisor, all those, all those sort of things, you were part of the White House. What would you expect to come out of this? Well, first, I would listen to Secretary Mnuchin because he's been in those rooms uh, fighting those fights and actually did a remarkable job negotiating at that time with Speaker Pelosi. Um, yesterday, you know, I think we're optimistic with how the meeting with President Biden and Speaker McCarthy mm -hmm. went. They really went out of their way to both make very positive statements. They have negotiated already a number of the thorniest issues. The, I think one of the largest ones that remain is how to deal with non-defense discretionary spending, which is 14 percent of the U.S. budget. And I believe they will get there. Um, I think in this case, um, they need to look like each side is fighting very hard for their positions, so getting a little too much to the edge. But I also recognize in the way they're talking about it and in the way I've heard from some of the negotiators on Capitol Hill that not only is this extremely economically damaging, there's real political cost yep. for both sides. Yep. So my prediction is it'll get too close for comfort, but there will be a resolution. At the very last moment. Mm -hmm. Bill Winters, you, 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 I'm sorry to come to you in this capacity of, of pessimism, but <laughs> to look at your industry, you've had Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, Credit Suisse. The other thing, apart from the debt ceiling and the inflation, which both uh, speakers have already mentioned, the other thing hanging out there is this idea that maybe the banking crisis is going to continue. Um, mm. How do you see that? Ah, I, I think we're pretty much done with the crisis phase, but I don't think we're done with the, 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 the need for an ongoing transformation. So every story is a little bit different, uh, but we know that at, at the heart of the U.S. regional bank challenge is that they, uh, many of them grew a little bit too fast without some of the conventional disciplines that uh, are, are normally evident in banking. Uh, and then with regulation that was a little bit differentiated uh, between that tier of banks and the large banks. Uh, and in an environment where interest rates uh, increase at an unprecedented rate, those weaknesses become clear. So I think the, the response from the, from the, the Fed in particular uh, of extending uh, term funding facilities to the entire U.S. banking industry, I won't say that the entire industry is guaranteed, but it's pretty close. Uh, so I think that, that extinguishes the crisis. Uh, Credit Suisse was a completely different situation, obviously in, in trouble for some time. And uh, while the, the conclusion was very surprising to me in terms of the way that the, uh, that the bank was resolved uh, through this, this you know, very unusual sale to, uh, to UBS with associated uh, unusual payments to shareholders versus bondholders. Do you, do you think that was one of the deals of the century for UBS? Yeah, <laughs> okay. I do. I think, I think they got a good deal. <laughs> so we should all have owned UBS. We can start with that. <laughs> Sorry, Bill, but in, just I'm um, interested yes, in one I, particular... I, I, I don't think there are big... When, when I look at the, the, at the banking industry, it's, it's very well capitalized right now. I think everybody's looking very carefully at their liquidity profile. And thankfully, Standard Charter Bank is, is uh, extremely liquid, uh, always has been. 
Uh, and I think most banks who have had consistent business models and consistent regulation are in a very good position uh, from that regard. But weakness, as we're seeing, weakness, and I think this will go across every industry, will be exposed by this economic environment that we're going into. So I think Dean is right uh, that, that we'll have a, a, a slowdown for sure. Recession, maybe mild, if so, mild most likely. Uh, but with high interest rates, uh, and then in particular, particularly in emerging markets, a uh, strong dollar relative to emerging markets currencies, weaknesses are going to be exploited very hard by the market. And we're one, seeing that. One thing which just occurred to me, because Dina mentioned it, on China, you do have the big worries about debt in China. How do you see those? It, Chinese debt levels in aggregate, so, so it's looking across the, the sovereign, uh, federal, the SOEs, and then even picking up the, the, the privately owned enterprises, in aggregate is fine. Uh, now there's always a question how it gets allocated out, uh, because there are clear uh, concentrations of debt, in, in particular in some local authorities, uh, that if left to their own devices, might be difficult to serve, but uh, look, looked at on a federal level, it's fine. Uh, one of the keys for China is that it continues to grow. So we're expecting 5.8% growth in China this year. They had a very good first quarter, slowed down in April and May. We think it'll normalize to around 5%. At 4 or 5% growth, the current debt level is no problem at all. If growth went down to, to European or even American levels, it could be challenging over time. But uh, I think that's quite unlikely given the investments that China's made. Can I ask you about something which I'll come back on to the other two panelists about, which is the idea of the Gulf here as a financial center. Um, particularly since COVID, you've seen many of the Gulf centers, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, here as well trying to bring financial services companies here, and obviously you're both here, but that especially kind of luring people from Asia, how, how do you think that is going? Oh, I think it's going extremely well. So uh, first of all, uh, well, first of all, let me add my thanks to, to Dina's and, uh, for, for having me here. Uh, but the, the interest, uh, as you know, Standard Chartered is very big throughout Asia, uh, as well as, as Qatar and, and the rest of the, of the Gulf and, and everything in between. The amount of interest out of China in the Gulf is extraordinary. Uh, we've already led three groups of clients. We've got Mandarin speakers sprinkled throughout the region. Uh, I think this is, and it's two way. It's both, it's both contracts and capital going both ways. Uh, so uh, what exactly makes something a financial center, we, we could probably d discuss all day long, but having a world-class investor, uh, turn to the, the, the gentleman on my right, uh, having a strong regulatory environment, and having a, a, an open economy, certainly as it relates to capital flows and, uh, and as it relates to investment, those are our prerequisites. And, and the, the Gulf is, is an absolute magnet, and, and Qatar is doing extraordinarily well in that context. Your Excellency, you're, you, I know you're, among other things, you're on the board of the stock exchange here. Yes. What do you, how do you see the future? What, what is your kind of vision for how this particular, both Doha, but just generally, Absolutely. Uh, I'll start with Doha, for example. After, uh, you know, we hosted the World Cup and we have built an infrastructure that was a plan to build in 30 years, we have built it in 10 years. Now I, the mindset is about how we could utilize this infrastructure and the local economy is becoming that, you know, the top items in our agenda. Uh, lately, for example, we have review, reviewed our, uh, you know, constitution as a QIA to make sure that we can play also as an enabler in the local market. And I think this is very important where, where institutions like us and, and maybe an investors who would like to be in the region and who would like to tap into the growth of this region, would like to create a partnership with an institution. And I know most of the sovereign wealth fund here in the, in the region, like PEF or Badala or Adia or KIA, all of them are, are playing the same role. Uh, you know, the government in the region have been, have been investing in education, infrastructure. We have a young leadership. And, and they, all of them are believe on really enhancing the local economy and, and bring prosperity to the, and they have everything. They have, you know, the population who are young, willing to produce, and we have the infrastructure and we put the legislation and we have the capital. And I'm sure other investors from the world would like to be part of this growth. And I, I think the equation is win-win is for all of us. Do you, but do you think, I mean, Financial services is more risky, with all due respect to Bill and Dina. And you were, I remember you, you had, you, I forgot you were part of Credit Suisse, yes. you were chairs in that. 
and as, certainly as a Briton, I can tell you that having exposure to the financial services industry in your economy isn't always a great thing. Does that, does that worry you at all? No, not at all. Uh, I think, you see, the banking sector is, is based on confidence. Mm -hmm. And whatever you do to your balance sheet, if you lose that confidence, you, will, you, will, uh, you are in collapse. So it is very important. If the case happened with the Credit Suisse, it doesn't mean that all of the banks have that issue. And whatever you do, I think all economies would like to have a banking system that could support them. I mean, you cannot grow, you cannot, businesses, corporate, they cannot perform very well unless they have very solid uh, banking system. So I'm not worried about this. And, you know, we are a very mature institution. I mean, managing the risk, uh, the risk and, and expecting the risk is, is part of our, our job, and this is our bread and butter. And in terms of going forward, when you look at this region, do you, do you think that there is a chance that we will talk about it in the same way as we talk about New York, London, Hong Kong, the main, or Singapore, or whatever the main centers are? Why not? I mean, we could, we could uh, complement these, uh, these cities. I think the globe and the population of this region by itself mm -hmm. is, is could capable to bring another city of, of, of the size of, you know, of Singapore or New York. So uh, I'm not saying why not, it, it could be. Dina, he, he loves you, they want, they want you here, but, but <laughs> you also mentioned earlier ESG, which you also uh, head up in your many jobs. Um, and how big do you see the, there, there is this big worry about climate change and climate finance, that mm -hmm. there is not enough money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make it happen. The bill is gigantic. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is enough cash? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we certainly don't have a client that isn't focused on this issue, climate finance, climate transition, and of course now more than ever with the energy market disruption uh, post-Ukraine. Um, I think there's certainly uh, more capital needed, but as we were talking about this morning, it's what kind of capital. There's investment capital, which is critical, um, which frankly uh, QIA has been very focused on this space, as we said. Um, there's philanthropic capital, which is very important, but I think there's a need for hybrid capital. And by that, I mean philanthropic and investment capital working together. We're very proud to have a partnership with Bloomberg Philanthropies mm. and the Asian Development Bank. Um, in this partnership, we've worked to create a financing facility uh, that we hope will, uh, our, our philanthropic capital will leverage up to $500 billion of riskier risk-taking capital, I guess I should say, uh, new models, smaller companies in Southeast Asia in particular with this facility that's just, you know, unavailable today. So, for example, one of our investments was an investment in a electric bus fleet in India. Um, probably Goldman Sachs wouldn't have made that investment on its own, but with the use of this shared facility, we're able to um, invest in that company. And, you know, as we sit here today, we have heads of state, multilateral institutions, sovereign wealth funds, other investors. I think that coming together and creating more of that hybrid capital would make a big difference. Do you now think that company, you, you've been on both sides of the sort of state and, and private thing. Do you think that now climate change and stuff like that is being led by the private sector more than governments? You look at the relative failure of things like COP. <laughs> well... I, I actually do think that the keys to really going through this climate transition period well and thinking about advancing um, are investment, innovation, and leadership. And I think the private sector has all three of those and is very focused. One, because there is a huge market opportunity. This is the industrial revolution of our generation mm -hmm. to some extent. And if we do it wisely, uh, there's enormous capital to be gained. But secondly, I actually think that what has happened over the last year and a half has really shown the importance of energy security, energy independence, um, and new sources of energy emerging. Bill, can I come to you with the other big one, which again, is ecstasy, and, and Dina mentioned earlier, which is AI. Everywhere you go, you see people being scared or incentivized by this wonderful new technology. How do you think that will change investment? I, I think it's going to change a lot of things. Uh, it already is. But I think we have to be careful about the words. I mean, if you asked the same question three years ago, you might have said uh, blockchain or something like that. And it was going to you know, change everything in the world overnight. Well, of course, it hasn't. It's a useful tool. AI is also uh, a, a useful tool. 
it will be applied to many more things than are actually artificial intelligence. That's the nature of, of the beast. But I think the, the, the fact that we're approaching that point of singularity where, uh, where machines are capable of, of reasonable thought uh, at a faster and more accurate rate than human beings, I mean, we, we will reach that point. Maybe we're, we're, we're definitely not there now, uh, but we will. And that will change the, the nature of work. And I think it will change the nature of relationships. And uh, it, to me, one of the most fascinating questions is, uh, w will we use AI to have better human interactions or will we displace human interactions? Uh, I'm sure that the, the, the first will happen. Uh, and we're, we're already doing that in banking. You're doing that in, in, uh, in every industry to one degree or other. M various machine learning, big data models to, uh, to uh, generate better recommendations for whatever the situation may be that's then synthesized by human beings and, and then communicated along with trust and commitment at a human level. I think that's going to stick around for a very long time. Uh, and I think we will make better decisions by virtue of the data. Uh, will, the, will the machines eventually displace human beings? I think we'll have to be very careful not to let that happen. Uh, I think we might have a better set of decisions, but a very dangerous world. Your Excellency, can I ask you on that? You, you have to look at investment over the very long term, and tech has been a, a part of that portfolio. Do you, are you rethinking everything? Bill, Bill, I think, correctly pointed out that blockchain two, three years ago, there would have been terrible bankers appearing telling you to invest in blockchain. Now, suddenly, it's AI. What, would you, do, you think, do you look on AI as something that changes your whole theory of investing in tech or not? No, it, it will not change the whole thing, but I, uh, it is a theme that we are applying. So from time to time, we, we tell our teams that this is very important, this is coming. Please look at it. Make sure that we, we build a portfolio that, that you know, tap into these themes. The same thing, for example, climate change, mm. digitalization, life science, these the long-term themes that, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, AI, I think this is, has been there. We have been investing in there. Uh, I think the level of using the AI in terms of the extreme where the machine would do everything, uh, personally, I have a mixed feeling about it. <laughs> and I, I feel that we need some sort of legislation that could manage this. But using the minor AI to help marketing, to help you know, companies understanding their businesses and so, I think uh, this is uh, a wonderful technology that we could, we could think, utilize. Do you, think it offers, do you think it offers a chance to a country like Qatar to, to, to leapfrog, to jump yeah. ahead? If you look at the way that, say, India leapfrogged in terms of healthcare provision and, and yes. using new technologies. Do you think that it gives Qatar a chance to move further? Absolutely. I mean, we are, in terms of the infrastructure, one of the leading countries in the region about the digitalization and the connect connectivity infrastructure that we have. And we would like to really tap into this as a strength of the countries to make sure that we can attract and invest in technologies that could be part of this, uh, f uh, you know, uh, FinTech, for example, is one of the pillar that Central Bank is taking as an initiative with the banks to make sure they could attract uh, this type of technology here. Dean, I'll give you the last word on, on, on AI and FinTech. Uh, at Goldman, are you worried by what FinTech will do, or are you optimistic about the ways you can use it? Well, certainly I think there's going to be advancement in a number of sectors. I think the one to worry about is, is national security. I think that there's actually um, quite a few uh, people who are extremely worried about what that means for mm. um, asymmetric warfare, you know, military investment, that sort of thing. So I think some of the focus, understandably right now, is on workforce, fintech, you know, new innovations, um, journalism and how it's affected <laughs> by AI, for example. I think what worries me is some of the things that we're not really thinking about at this stage, and there doesn't obviously seem to be any regulation on that, and I think that's something we have to focus on. I think you've managed to prove as a panel that we don't, we possibly won't be replaced by machines, or at least <laughs> the three of you won't. Um, I might well be. Uh, thank you very much um, for all the three of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, John. Thank you.